Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to uh, tune in, in to this webinar sponsored by uh, Functional Formularies. Uh, my name is Mark Pettis. I serve as the medical director for Functional Formularies. I also uh, serve as the associate dean of medical education at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and uh, director of population health uh, for Berkshire Health Systems in Western Massachusetts. So it's a, it's a great honor and a joy to uh, share with you uh, this morning. Uh, I do want to remind our uh, attendees that uh, CEU certificates will go out to you by email uh, for this program, uh, probably over the next 24 hours. And a, a recording of this will be available on Functional Formularies website uh, for you to go back to um, at, at your um, uh, discretion uh, if, if there's anything you would like to uh, review. This and prior webinars. This will be the end of what has been a several part series. And uh, we'll take the summer off and then uh, um, look at programming as we get uh, back into the fall. So today's topic uh, is the hidden dangers in food, uh, the dirty dozen of ingredients. And uh, this falls into that category of um, being aware of just how complicated our food supply has become. And um, much of what I'll be reviewing with you uh, has varying degrees of research and evidence attached to it. And uh, there, there, there tends to be a bit of an overwhelming uh, sense of wow uh, when you when you begin to look at just how often now uh, foods that um, are just a regular part of our day to day nutrition are now tainted in ways that really uh, should give us all pause. So that said, let me uh, just get the slides moving forward here. Our objectives are to explore some common ingredients, additives, chemical residues. There are scores and scores of them. I tried to narrow this down to what I would consider to be some of the top uh, dozen. Uh, to also briefly look at the mechanisms that link how these new to nature molecules uh, impact risk to human health. And then we will identify some strategies that can best assure a lower burden of toxin exposure. There isn't anyone who wouldn't look at our modern environment and be quick to note just how pervasive environmental toxins have become, and not just in our food supply, but in our air and our water and our soil. And this is a very difficult area of research, uh, which serves uh, industry quite well, because much of this research uh, looks at animal studies, uh, looks at um, um, individual environmental toxins. Uh, and when you look at most Americans, uh, the average American will have anywhere from 280 to 300 environmental toxins circulating in their system at the time of birth. And so it can be very difficult to extrapolate an animal study that looks at one particular toxin uh, to the epidemiology of human health and disease. Uh, and this plays well into the hands of, of industry like Monsanto. And I, I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to politicize the topic, uh, but it's very easy to take the stance of show me the evidence, uh, show me the clinical trials. Um, uh, th there is just an abundance of data that should give anyone pause with respect to just how profound and significant environmental toxins are in, in human health. And I, I think about this in terms of death by a thousand cuts. Um, exposure to uh, pesticide residues or preservatives in that particular moment uh, may not uh, create any noteworthy impact to the individual consuming them. But daily consumption, day after day, uh, can, can clearly be linked at many levels uh, to various aspects of human health uh, and human risk. And if you look just in general at 
toxins, uh, whether whether they're toxins in our foods, as we're we're reflecting on today, uh, or in our water and our soil, uh, and and medications that we're taking. Uh, there are certain patterns that are, are consistent with toxins, regardless of their type and source. And these patterns almost universally seem to affect our immune systems. So it's very common to see strong associations between exposure and things like allergies, asthma, um, chronic infections, um, autoimmunity, of course, uh, which has become um, epidemic. The nervous system is a ripe and, and vulnerable target for uh, environmental toxins. Um, it, this is a very metabolically active system, as everyone knows. Uh, the complex uh, neurochemistry frequently can be impacted uh, by toxins, and we'll look at some examples of this in a moment. I think a huge area is endocrine disruption. Our endocrine systems, and if you measure hormones in any human, the biologic activity is in negligibly small blood levels. And many of the uh, environmental toxins that we'll be reviewing are known to exceed levels uh, in humans that are known to disrupt endocrine function. And this can take the form of a thyroid disruption. Uh, it can take the form of uh, estrogen uh, and testosterone disruption. And when you look at the um, overwhelming prevalence of endocrine disorders these days from polycystic ovarian disease to breast cancer uh, to uh, testosterone, low testosterone syndrome to infertility. Uh, the list continues to grow in a very concerning way. And we know that most environmental toxins that have been studied have been demonstrated in some way to disrupt our endocrine systems. And we also know from epigenetic research that toxins can alter gene expression patterns. Uh, examples of this that have been widely studied would include um, plasticizers like bisphenol A and phthalates, and that these can be passed from one generation to another. So what we inherit ultimately from our parents are not only the genes that, that uh, code for proteins, but we inherit the environmental and social conditions within which our parents and perhaps even our grandparents lived. So with each passing generation, we are seeing this legacy of environmental toxins affecting on an epigenetic level gene expression. And uh, you know that's a pretty profound consideration when you begin to look at uh, how uh, young children, uh, developing children, um, can be impacted by the environment of, of mom and dad. Uh, and so I think while we still have a lot to learn about these um, mechanisms and impacts, it's quite clear that oxidative stress and endocrine disruption, genotoxicity to human DNA, mitochondrial damage, uh, which uh, is, is one of the more important organelles from a neurodegenerative and immuno immunologic and cancer perspective are disrupted in some way by these patterns. Uh, and uh, I, I, everything that we'll be talking about in some way can be linked to these emerging mechanisms. And I wanted to just briefly touch on what I think was landmark work done by uh, Claudia Miller, Dr. Claudia Miller. This, this original work goes back now some 20 years, and this is a, a theory that continues to uh, be affirmed by much of the more uh, uh, contemporary research. And it's clear that some people are more sensitive to uh, toxin exposure for, for various reasons. We know there's a threshold. There is a point beyond which the burden of toxins. It's like filling a cup. Eventually, for that individual, the cup can only accommodate so much before it starts to overflow. And we know that many of these foreign chemicals, these antigens, will begin to affect immunologic function. Uh, and Miller developed this theory of toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. Um, our ability to uh, see something foreign and um, 
tolerate it, uh, begins to transform into a hypervigilant immune system that has lost its tolerance. And for people who have unique sensitivity, these antigenic triggers, uh, many of which um, are included in what we'll be looking at, are known to provoke immunologic function in ways that may lead to things like autoimmunity, but often lead to just multi-system signs and symptoms that, that are inflammatory by nature uh, and can affect anything from cognition to uh, rashes to, uh, again, endocrine-related issues to gut-related issues. Uh, and I think it's important to examine this in the context of that big picture. When you start adding the burden of environmental toxins that we are exposed to, to many challenges in modern life that might include chronic sleep disruption, chronic stress overload, um, social isolation, um, toxins uh, from other forms that might be impacting our microbiome and gut permeability, you can begin to see why so many people are in the midst of this perfect storm of multiple triggers that lead to mediators that ultimately influence their health, sometimes in a very subtle way over many, many years. And again, many of these mechanisms are now being linked to diseases that we would categorize as autoimmunity or allergies or asthma, uh, chemical sensitivities, you know, fibromyalgia. And what many of these have in common, again, are their disrupted mitochondrial and metabolic um, function and, and, and systems. Uh, we, we talked about the endocrine and uh, disruptive nature that many of these have, probably in some way contributing with other factors to obesity and PMS and um, fibroids, uh, et cetera. The neurologic issues, and again, the nervous system as a very vulnerable system with respect to environmental toxins probably is contributing to much of what we see in terms of autism and ALS and, and Parkinson's. And then add to that uh, depression, anxiety, these brain-related inflammatory disorders uh, that, that many of these toxins uh, have been associated with. And there's an abundance and growing evidence also that looks at burden of toxins as measured by blood and urine levels with much greater risk for diabetes, insulin resistance, cardiovascular diseases, and many cancers. So let's start with what I would consider to be uh, one, of the, one of the most important environmental toxins of all, and that is glyphosate. And many of you I know are familiar with glyphosate. This is a, um, an herbicide that was developed in the early 70s. Monsanto got the patent on, on glyphosate, and it has dramatically escalated in the use of our agricultural techniques around the world. This is the active ingredient in Roundup. And if you look at glyphosate application, uh, this is uh, in the United States over the last uh, 20 years or so, you see dramatic increases um, overall. Much of the use historically has been for corn and, and soybean. Uh, these are the most common genetically modified um, uh, plants uh, for which uh, glyphosate has been applied. But there are many, many other crops now that we'll look at that are now exposed to extraordinary amounts of, of glyphosate. And um, this, I think, is uh, perhaps uh, one of the single most important environmental toxins right now in the United States and around the world. And if you look at just in the US, how much of this is used uh, you know, over the last uh, 20 plus years, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, in, in recent years, we've seen a um, tripling, quadrupling of the amount of glyphosate that is used in our uh, agriculture. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of stunning when you look at the, uh, the amount used here on the left side of this, of this uh, table in millions of kilograms. Uh, 2005 to 2014, uh, you know, over a billion kilograms of glyphosate uh, were applied uh, to our our uh, foods and and you know again these represent tremendous increases that continue to go up 
And again, while many crops are now being exposed to glyphosate, much of the emphasis has been on the genetic modification and you know, rendering soybeans and corn um, resistant to the herbicide glyphosate. So essentially these crops are modified to be resistant to the toxicity of glyphosate, which allows the farmers to essentially drench their crops with glyphosate uh, as a, uh, an herbicide, uh, while the plant remains resistant to that. And again, uh, these are in uh, um, you know, pounds of use, millions of pounds in our soybean and corn uh, industry. But you see many other um, crops now that are affected. And, and one that is of real importance right now are many grains, uh, wheat and oats, now get significant application of glyphosate as a browning agent. Um, and, and browning is a process whereby farmers of wheat and, and oats uh, can spray their crops uh, over a couple of weeks to accelerate the, the desiccation, the browning, the drying out, which can prepare these crops for harvest uh, in a more accelerated time frame. It makes the harvesting a, a bit easier uh, and um, it, it's less wear and tear on the agricultural equipment as, as these plants are brown and, and are harvested with greater ease. Um, and then you can see many other uh, crops here from beets uh, to alfalfa uh, and canola, of course, is a, is a, a very important uh, GMO product that, um, uh, in my view, is, is best avoided. And this is just an overview. This was published in May of, of 2014 by the USDA, and it really looked at um, pesticide use uh, in addition to um, herbicide use in um, crops that are grown. And again, you can see glyphosate and natrazine are responsible for about two out of three of the most commonly used pesticides in our modern agriculture. And this is an example of the browning process. Uh, and again, browning serves the farmer in a very advantageous way. Uh, but we're now realizing that many foods, many grain-based foods, have exceedingly high levels of glyphosate residues in them as a consequence of using these techniques. And this is an example. This is a bit of an eye-opener, uh, particularly uh, if, if you're a parent and, and have young kids, or if you're working with clients that have young children. Uh, you know, many of these foods that uh, our pediatricians might consider safe to start as early as six months of age are loaded with glyphosate residues. And uh, just looking at, at some of these levels, you know, in, in, in Cheerios and, uh, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios, Wheaties, you know, pick your cold cereal, uh, most of which are uh, wheat and oat based. They have very, very high levels of uh, uh, glyphosate and in parts per billion. And the point that I would make here is that if you look at original Cheerios, which has glyphosate levels of over a thousand parts per billion, we know, and in animal studies, that as little as 0.05 parts per billion can be associated in animals, rodents, fish, with liver and renal toxicity with uh, some cancers. So very low levels in animals are associated with systemic toxicity. Uh, and these levels in food far, far exceed those levels. And now, you know, Monsanto and, and uh, other manufacturers would say, well, you know, you, you can't extrapolate animal data to human studies and, and human data is somewhat limited. But uh, a recent paper uh, from uh, Indiana uh, in pregnant women found that uh, well over 90% of, of pregnant women, this is data that has not yet been published but will be later this year, uh, over 90% of pregnant women have, have significant glyphosate in their urine. And you know the, 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 the fetuses they are carrying are getting significant exposure to these. 
So these are foods that uh, contain a great deal amount of uh, residues, and these are not genetically modified foods for the most part. Um, so it, it, it's just, a, I think, a profound eye-opener in terms of how mindful we need to be as to just how pervasive current agricultural techniques and use of glyphosate have on our, on our health. And glyphosate has a host of interesting biologic mechanisms. It, it's known to be an inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 system, uh, essential for detoxification. Um, uh, we know that these xenobiotics, these foreign substances, will tend to accumulate, particularly in people who may be predisposed. Um, human cell cultures have been shown to have DNA damage, mitochondrial disruption, as I have alluded to. And again, many of these are in vitro studies, so they don't get a lot of attention, uh, yet they should be looked at with a great deal of concern. Um, researchers like Stephanie Seneff at MIT, uh, the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, um, Anthony Samsel, uh, uh, people like um, uh, Don Huber, Dr. Don Huber, H-U-B-E-R, have shown significant impacts that glyphosate has on sulfation. Uh, sulfation is an essential metabolic step that renders activity to vitamin D and helps us with detoxification and help lines our blood vessels to make them more resistant to blood clotting. Um, glyphosate, because it contains glycine, uh, will interfere with that process. And we know that there are significant effects on the metabolism of microorganisms in the human gut. And uh, glyphosate will disrupt the what's called the shikimate pathway. This is a pathway that affects microbiologic production of neurotransmitters, uh, amino acids like tryptophan and tyrosine, uh, which uh, are, are converted into serotonin and dopamine, are impacted uh, by this pathway. Uh, we talked about the estrogenic, the, the, uh, the endocrine disruptive uh, features, altered gut barrier function. Um, again, uh, there are many links to glyphosate and its alterations on the gut microbiome, which is one of the central aspects of pro-inflammatory uh, disruption in, in human health. Um, glyphosate is also a chelator of heavy metals. It, it had an original patent to remove heavy metal residues in plumbing and uh, because it chelated those metals so effectively. So soils that get large concentrations of this will tend to get more depletion of essential minerals like magnesium, and selenium, and zinc. And, and we talked about that in last month's uh, webinar. There's a lot of very good information uh, out there on this, and uh, Jeffrey Smith has really been a pioneer as a, an educator and as an advocate, and I highly recommend his um, website, uh, the Institute for Responsible Technology. It's a wonderful source of very objective uh, information uh, and something I share all the time with my colleagues and with clients that I serve. Outside of the glyphosate category, you know, there are many other pesticides, and and um, uh, in this case, this 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 category uh, of the uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, this is a, a family of pesticides that has also seen dramatic increases in use uh, over the last 15 or so years. And again, this is just a look at some of the common crops where these uh, pesticides are are applied. And one of the concerns, in addition to much of the toxicity that we have talked about uh, with, with these pesticides and herbicides, uh, the neonicotinoids have been associated uh, with what might be a significant contributor to the, to the uh, depletion, to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the demolition, if you will, of our pollinating bee population. As many of you know, we've seen significant drops around the world of the honeybee population and these fallouts of hives and, and collapsing of, of these uh, uh, colonies of, of honeybees. And many of these compounds have been found in pollen. Many of these compounds 
are probably affecting the immune systems and neurotoxicity of honeybees. Uh, and this is perhaps a, a, a crisis that uh, um, has yet to be fully realized when you consider the fact that most of the crops around the world require pollination for adequate production. So I, I know that many of you are aware of the Environmental Working Group, and I find this to be really nice, uh, a nice tool, and they have many tools uh, for uh, consumers. And uh, I always like their dirty dozen list. And so when I'm working with clients, many of whom have very limited resources and can't always uh, buy organic all of the time, I just try to help them be more selective with where the highest pesticide residues exist. And uh, again, this is not, these are pesticide residues uh, that are, are related, but a little bit different than genetic modification using glyphosate. Um, so, you know, for example, you won't find a genetically modified corn on this dirty dozen list, uh, yet it should be a significant concern because of the glyphosate residues, if it indeed is coming from a genetic modified source, as more than 90% of our corn does. So I just want to, I want to make that caveat. Uh, but if you look at, you know, strawberries, spinach, nectarines, apples, peaches, pears, cherries, grapes, celery, tomatoes, you know, sweet bell peppers, potatoes, these have some of the highest pesticide residues. Uh, and even though washing is, is very important, um, it will not remove the residues that have been absorbed and penetrated the substance of the plant. Uh, and again, the Clean 15 is certainly safer from the perspective of surface pesticide residues, uh, but you'll see things like sweet corn uh, that I would be very concerned about if it's coming from a, genetic, a genetically modified source. So I just want to, I want to just raise that caveat. But outside of those exceptions, um, uh, you know, these are uh, Clean 15 that generally are safer for consumption and do not uh, necessarily have to be organic. So I just want to switch my attention to uh, uh, fructose. And, uh, you know, fructose can be an additive in the form of high fructose corn syrup, um, but it's also just a byproduct of sucrose and sugar. And uh, th this perhaps is, is just as important uh, from the perspective of what I would consider a toxin uh, that many people on a standard American diet are simply exceeding their capacity to adequately manage. Um, so we know that fructose from uh, either sugar or from high fructose corn syrup consumption has, has gone up dramatically um, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, and fructose is unique. And though structurally it looks a lot like glucose, Fructose is metabolized in the liver, and its metabolic effects are very similar to ethanol. Um, Robert Lustig at uh, UC San Francisco has done a lot of research in this area, and I, I highly recommend his work for anyone who's interested in learning more about the toxicity of fructose. Uh, it has been linked with multiple cardiometabolic risk factors, and um, I'll show you a slide in a moment, but whether whether you're looking at fatty liver, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, um, high triglycerides, uh, fructose, I think, is a major contributor to this epidemic of cardiometabolic risk factor. And it's converted to glyoxal, um, glyoxalate. These are, these are metabolites of fructose that are known to be disruptive. Uh, to the gut microbiome as well as to mitochondrial function. And it can impact the microbiome of the gut. Uh, and again, in a very uh, pro-inflammatory way, leading to fatty liver. Uh, and I, I think of fructose essentially as a dose response. If um, uh, 25 grams a day is probably a safe upper limit of fructose uh, consumption, hopefully coming from, from uh, uh, clean, uh, fruit sources, um, but people who chronically exceed that amount um, are going to be at much greater risk for these cardiometabolic risk factors. And and anyone who is already confronting those cardiometabolic risk factors, and almost everyone I see, 
is dealing with it in some way, I look very carefully with them at uh, fructose, uh, sugar, and try to help them find what are usually many, many opportunities for scaling back on those foods. Uh, and I know that you're all uh, well aware of the um, epidemiology of, of fructose. And uh, again, really, this was introduced uh, much like glyphosate back in the uh, 70s. So, you know, over the last 40 years or so, we've seen these dramatic rises in uh, high fructose corn syrup use as an artificial sweetener, very inexpensive. Uh, and I do think there's much more awareness of this. Uh, and uh, industry is starting to scale back uh, some, but there's still a great deal of exposure that people are getting. And this is just a, uh, a look at sugar. And again, I know everyone is, is quite well aware of this, but if you turn the clock back 100 or more years, we've just seen this uh, skyrocketing increase in sugar intake. And there's a very strong correlation and many mechanisms that are, that are known to directly link these increases in sugar and the fructose they contain with obesity prevalence, cardiometabolic prevalence, cardiovascular disease prevalence, uh, and adding to that list now would be things like neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, uh, autism, autism spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, fructose, regardless of its source, is unique in how it impacts insulin resistance which is one of the metabolic fault lines. I would say insulin resistance, inflammation, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction are metabolic fault lines that are linked with virtually every chronic complex disease. And fructose has some unique um, mechanisms whereby uh, these risk factors are perpetuated, as you see in this slide. So moving from there, a very common food additive that many people are aware of are nitrites and nitrates. Uh, these are coloring agents, they're preservatives, uh, they can add flavoring, particularly for uh, cured meats like bacon, salami, hot dogs, uh, sausages, you know, we're in the grilling season. Um, and uh, these, these, uh, these molecules will combine with proteins, particularly when they're heated at high temperatures to form nitrosamines. And the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, has declared nitrates and nitrates as probable carcinogens. And there's a great deal of, of evidence now that links processed meats with cancer, colon cancer being most widely uh, associated. And while red meats in general have been associated with cancer, I believe a lot of that has to do with the sourcing of the meat and certainly cured meats uh, I would put in a very different category as I might, uh, you know, a grass-fed uh, uh, beef uh, or, you know, uh, uh, a meat that has not been uh, cured. Um, but the, the links to gastrointestinal uh, cancers, including uh, stomach, esophagus, and colon, I think can be very, very concerning. Uh, and so this is something that I look at closely. There are natural sources of nitrates and leafy greens. Um, like most things in nature, um, there are no known association uh, with, with health concerns when you're getting them in those forms. Potassium bromate. Uh, potassium bromate is used to strengthen bread uh, and dough, and it, and it really helps uh, the, the dough to rise during baking. And uh, again, the International um, Cancer Agency considers this as a possible human uh, carcinogen. And um, in animal studies, and again, a lot of this data comes from animal studies, um, which is a source of criticism by some, uh, yet it, it simply can't be denied. Uh, you know, many tumors have been associated with potassium bromate, in including uh, kidney cancer, and it's known uh, to be a mutagen. And, and while baking will convert most of potassium bromate to a non-carcinogenic form, uh, research in the United Kingdom ha has shown that bromate residues are still very common in many uh, uh, finished bread products. Uh, and um, 
um, you know, many many parts of the world, like the UK, Canada, the European Union, will will prohibit the use of these these substances. Uh, but in the United States, um, we we tend not to follow the precautionary principle, uh, where in other parts of the world, uh, you have to first demonstrate safety before you put it into the marketplace. In the U.S., uh, it's okay to go to the marketplace until you can somehow prove that it is dangerous and bad for you. All right, go figure. Propyl paraben, uh, this is also a very common food additive uh, that um, uh, you know the, the FDA considers generally recognized as safe. It has this grass status. It's, it's used as a preservative in, in foods such as uh, tortillas, muffins, uh, some food dyes. Um, and again, studies in animals have shown that um, even small amounts of circulating propyl paraben will affect uh, testosterone production and sperm counts. And again, infertility is a huge problem. Uh, and, and there are many men who uh, have diminished uh, sperm uh, quality and quantity, as well as low testosterone. And there are probably many environmental exposures that are contributing to that endocrine uh, disruption. It also has weak uh, estrogenic properties, as many of these toxins do. Uh, and again, um, uh, some uh, in vitro research suggesting alteration of gene expression and breast cancer, and uh, um, over 91% of Americans who have been tested um, will have detectable levels of, of propyl paraben in their urine. Another preservative that is very common in our food supply is butylated hydroxy anisole, BHA. And this is another uh, molecule that the FDA considers uh, a grass status. Uh, again, the international cancer, the recurrent themes here, as you can see, uh, the International Cancer Agency considers it a possible human carcinogen. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, California uh, uh, bans uh, the use of BHA. Uh, and, and consistent uh, with this has been evidence that BHA can cause tumors in animals. Uh, again, um, the, the, the controversy is to what extent is this problematic in, in humans? And uh, again, the European Union um, also classifies a BHA as an endocrine disruptor at higher doses. It can affect testosterone and thyroid function as well. Uh, and animal studies have shown impacts on sperm quality uh, as well as uh, estrogen production. So there are a wide range of foods that contain this, uh, particularly uh, chips and uh, again, meats that are, that are preserved. Um, and so uh, I think BHA is definitely on the top a list of the dirty dozen uh, food additives. And its uh, first cousin, uh, butylated hydroxytoluin or BHT, uh, again has grass status, uh, but it too um, is a, a common uh, preservative added to foods. And um, these agents probably are synergistic and additive in their effects. Uh, it has been shown in animals to have carcinogenic effects. Um, in the lung and in the liver, and uh, developmental issues are also concerning uh, with respect to uh, thyroid and endocrine signaling. I just want to touch briefly on the uh, this broad category of uh, artificial uh, coloring. Artificial colors are, you know, have been in our food supply for many, many years, and. Um, certainly can increase the appeal of foods. Um, as you all know, they have zero nutritional value. And many of the concerns, uh, though the, the research is uh, conflicting, um, but some studies have found that these uh, artificial colorings can be associated uh, with hyperactivity, uh, particularly in association with a benzoate, sodium benzoate, a, a, a preservative. And uh, the European Food Safety Authority uh, has, you know, considered much of the research to be statistically significant. And uh, again, individuals that are more sensitive may struggle with, you know, hyperactivity, with uh, um, learning uh, challenges and, and, and deficits. And, 
you know, I think the while the jury is still out on, uh, you know, many of the uh, exact mechanisms and just how uh, pervasive uh, toxicity is, um, you know, for the most part, these are, you know, petroleum derived substances that have no nutritional value whatsoever. Uh, and if you, you look at some dyes, I would say of the dyes that are most uh, widely considered problematic would be the uh, yellow five, um, um, as, as it's referred to, uh, blue two and three. Uh, these all have, you know, just sort of basic uh, um, uh, characterizations in their names. Uh, red three, uh, you know, these are all dyes that are somewhat controversial. I, I would say red three and yellow five are two of the more common and controversial dyes that um, are potentially problematic. Um, possibly carcinogenic, um, possibly neurotoxic, uh, and while it may be a smaller percentage of people exposed that are sensitive to these dyes, uh, I would be particularly concerned in young children, particularly those that may have, you know, ADD or ADHD or other uh, behavioral uh, uh, issues, uh, and I wouldn't hesitate to be careful to review uh, diets for um, artificial coloring and to eliminate them on that basis. A common uh, question that I get, and I suspect that many of you get as well, as what is the risk of, of carrageenan? And, and carrageenan, as, as many of you know, is a, a very common food additive that is extracted from red seaweed, the, the chondrus crispus red seaweed uh, species. Uh, carrageenan has no nutritional value, and it's used mostly as a, a thickener, an emulsifier, uh, to improve the texture of, of food, particularly uh, many um, uh, uh, milks and creamers, uh, yogurts, cottage cheese, other, other processed foods. The concern with carrageenan, and like many of these um, uh, concerning food additives, there probably are some people that are more sensitive to it than others. Um, the concern is raised in carrageenan's relationship to uh, inflammation, particularly with respect to the gut. And uh, again, the, the research is relatively limited uh, and somewhat conflicting, uh, but uh, there's very little question in my mind that there are some people whose gut issues, uh, particularly if they have dysbiosis, particularly if they may have food sensitivities, gluten sensitivity, for example, uh, particularly if they have a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There are some people with leaky gut and dysbiosis that may be more sensitive to, to carrageenan and may find that their symptoms, both gastrointestinal and systemically, uh, can be accentuated with regular consumption. And this is a, a more recent paper that looked at some of the pro-inflammatory effects of carrageenan. Uh, and this looked at NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is a, a nuclear transcription factor that upregulates a whole host of inflammatory and proliferative uh, metabolic pathways. Uh, and it has been shown in, in humans uh, to uh, be provoked by carrageenan exposure. Um, and also related to uh, epithelial barrier disruption or leaky gut. And the more we begin to associate the prevalence of epithelial barrier function um, um, dysregulation uh, with systemic inflammation, and those individuals, I tend to be very uh, cautious with carrageenan and generally would recommend that it that it not be a part of anyone's day-to-day -day, uh, nutritional program. Artificial sweeteners, again, a kind of a broad category with a, lo with a lot of uh, research, some of which is conflicting, uh, some of which is, is predominantly in animal trials. Um, but again, I apply this sort of ancestral evolutionary bio biologic lens. Um, any molecule that is new to nature with regular exposure is likely to have some biologic impact. Some individuals may be more sensitive 
to the magnitude of those impacts, uh, some less so. Uh, but the research, j just sort of to review this to a, a couple of bullet, bullet points, um, basically shows uh, mixed relationships with weight, uh, with hunger, uh, with uh, energy expenditure and caloric intake, um, there have been a few very small studies suggesting that people with type 2 diabetes that switch from sugar products to sugar-free products with these non-nutritive sweeteners uh, might have slight improvement in their glycemic control. Uh, but there are also studies to suggest that the opposite might happen, that you can actually worsen insulin resistance um, more research is clearly needed here, uh, but in general, um, uh, I just do not see the value at all of any of these artificial sweeteners for any person under any circumstance. A, a widely quoted study in Nature 2014 was the effect of um, artificial sweeteners on the gut microbiome. Uh, and. Um, Anything that's impacting the gut microbiome, even if the ultimate expression for that person may be unclear, is uh, a mechanism that would give me concern. Um, the research really hasn't mounted in a consistent way to suggest that artificial sweeteners increase cancer risk. Um, uh, you know, some of the old cyclamate trials and, and bladder cancer were not confirmed in, in subsequent studies. Um, if you look at aspartame, which is uh, a bit unique, uh, there are certainly some individuals uh, who are sensitive to that and may have accentuation of depression, um, headaches, you know, migraine, um, anxiety, and uh, hypersensitivity, if you will. So uh, th those are individuals that I definitely would want to get off aspartame if they're otherwise uh, reluctant and looking for motivation. Um, yeah, at least as of 2017, stevia appears to be relatively safe. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get a lot more data on that as as, uh, as time goes on. The sugar alcohols, which can be uh, problematic for some people who are sensitive to sugar alcohols, but um, smaller amounts of erythritol and xylitol uh, in the current literature would suggest to be a bit safer and generally better tolerated unless a person is having gastrointestinal issues and on a, on a low FODMAP, uh, th then that would be a different consideration with some of these sugar alcohols. This was a more recent um, uh, cohort study looking at people using chronic artificial sweeteners and obesity. And uh, the, the take home message is that low calorie sweetener does seem to be independently associated with heavier relative weight, larger waist, and a higher prevalence and incidence of abdominal obesity, suggesting that low calorie sweeteners may not be an effective means of weight control. And that's where my mindset is at right now. These are super sweet, 200, 300 times as sweet as sugar. There's some interesting suggestion that they may increase appetite. Uh, because of the effect on our taste buds and that super sweetness sort of prepares our brain for a, a high caloric load. And if that caloric load is not forthcoming, uh, our um, neurotransmitters will assure that they align themselves in a way that will make more likely more consumption. And so um, I do worry about some of these mechanisms. And uh, I do think these are significant enough concerns that uh, they should be avoided altogether. And aspartame, again, is a bit of a unique player um, in that, you know, NutraSweet and Equal are the most common sources of aspartame. Um, these are um, methyl esters of aspartic acid and, and phen uh, phenylalanine. And as aspartame breaks down, it'll break down into aspartic acid, which is known to have toxic effects on the brain. And again, there are probably people who are sensitive to that, uh, that may, may have ADD, HD, or, or anxiety disorders, or, or depression, um, where these mechanisms might be quite significant. In addition to that, uh, methanol is a metabolic byproduct, uh, and in addition to formaldehyde and formic acid, is known to have toxic effects on the human brain. And so, you know, while definitive proof may be lacking, 
and I often tell clients and colleagues, you know, um, absence of, of proof is not proof of absence. And um, anyone dealing with um, learning disabilities, attention deficit issues, depression, headaches, in my view, should have complete elimination of aspartame uh, in whatever source it is coming from. A couple of uh, websites that I that many of you may already be aware of, and um, I frequently refer clients to uh, that I think are just really good and objective sources of information. They also have some great tools uh, for your clients, um, like the Dirty Dozen uh, tools. Um, but the Environmental Working Group does a lot of really nice work in this area, and they have great resources uh, like Good Food on a Tight Budget and uh, Shopper's Guide for Avoiding you know, Genetically Modified Foods. Um, some of the um, um, seafood guide and concerns with, you know, with heavy metals, um, just a really nice uh, clearinghouse for uh, objective information and some useful tools uh, for your, your colleagues as well as uh, your clients. Uh, and they also have some great apps uh, that I often recommend and that I use. Uh, one is their Healthy Living app. Uh, this is a database of um, not just foods, but they have over 80,000 foods in their database. Uh, and they are graded based on their uh, pesticide residues and processing and, and uh, containing of artificial coloring and preservatives uh, and can be a nice, uh, simple way for people to quickly get a, a risk stratification of the food they're about to purchase. Um, and uh, they also have other things in the database, including uh, cosmetics and, and cleaning products. Uh, and I also like their non-GMO uh, shopping guide. And, and again, when you start looking at the, the sheer prevalence of genetic modification of food, in addition to many of the food additives that we've discussed, uh, it, it can almost begin to feel overwhelming as one attempts to limit their burden of exposure here. And at the end of the day, as many of you I, I understand, are, are well aware of, uh, th this comes down to uh, just good common sense uh, so that, uh, you know, eating organic and being GMO free is just clearly the way to go to the extent that one can. And as, as you are working with clients who may have limited resources, may have limitations in health literacy, uh, and these are, these are very common, um, I'm always just trying to find those areas of opportunity. Uh, if I can get someone just to cut back on their sugar and fructose consumption, you know, I consider that a, a huge victory. Um, there may be others with more resources that, um, uh, you know, just need more help in understanding where glyphosate is showing up and, and what they can do to avoid that or uh, to be going more organic uh, with the dirty dozen, uh, but it, but in general, clean and green is is just the way to go. And we know that many aspects of lifestyle in general can help us better manage loads of toxins. And and again, whether that's through more consumption of plant-based foods that can help assist the uh, biotransformation or detoxification pathways uh, in our liver, good hydration uh, and helping the kidney uh, uh, excrete uh, toxins more effectively, uh, focusing on the gut uh, through you know, cleaning up the diet and elimination of, of, of gluten. Uh, and I think uh, if, if one already isn't concerned about wheat and many grains, Hopefully, this presentation will add even further evidence that until the USDA and FDA and the EPA starts uh, testing more systematically, and, and who knows if that you know when that day will come. With our current political leadership and administration, uh, it's hard to imagine that we're going to see acceleration of um, 
regulation. Uh, this really forces us as caregivers and as consumers to do all that we can to take matters into our own hands and to educate ourselves to do the best we can to buy local, uh, to buy organic, um, and to share the word with those we love and those we, we care for uh, so that they can be more empowered stewards of self-care because the agencies that we would otherwise look to to provide safeguards are not likely to be impacting this big picture in the foreseeable future. And I also remind caregivers and my clients that managing toxins uh, can go well beyond just that which is in our food supply uh, and in our cosmetics, uh, but also involves you know, managing toxic thought patterns and um, people who may be struggling with um, depression, with PTSD, with um, you know, anxiety, um, that you know, loving oneself, um, um, considering the possibility of re-examining how, how you're interpreting and responding to a set of stressful conditions in your life can dramatically enhance your total body health and your total body capacity to become more resilient in the face of a more uh, environmentally toxic um, uh, place that, that we all live and, and, and work in now. Um, and then I would say lastly, um, you know, I think relationships uh, are, where the rubber meets the road and as organizations like Moms Across America and just so many um, beautiful advocacy groups uh, get the word out to others, Jeffrey Smith and his, and his work, um, this is really where we as consumers uh, can take matters into our own hands. This is bringing the power back to the people. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a 60s guy, so for me, this, this is like coming home uh, people really need to begin to touch as many others as they can so that we as consumers and the power that we have as a collective can begin to change the way our legislators and industry respond. And um, I think we already see examples of this uh, with more products now eliminating uh, high fructose corn syrup. I do think that we're seeing uh, uh, more momentum toward organic but still today, only 1% of all farming in the United States is organic. And so these farmers need our support at our farmers markets. Uh, they need our, our uh, advocacy. And uh, you know, together, I do think we can begin to shift the tide here. Uh, and as important as this is to us as adults, this is really about what we're leaving behind, right? For our, our kids and their kids, um, uh, and they're the canaries in the coal mine. And as a, as a parent and as a, an educator, you know, I find that very unsettling, uh, which is why I, I feel so strongly about this work. So it's uh, been a pleasure. Um, I, uh, again, want to remind you that this presentation will be archived on the Functional Formulary website probably over the next 24, 48 hours. The uh, CEU certificates will be uh, coming your way for those that um, have signed in. And uh, it's a great honor to uh, have a little bit of your precious time. I applaud your work in the world. Uh, keep fighting the good fight. And uh, thank you for listening.